Well, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back. This is another Red Pill Religion podcast. Red Pill Religion. You don't have to be religious. It's totally optional. However, that doesn't mean you get to lie about religion and abuse religious people, which you would think the average non-religious person, atheist or not, would uh, immediately grasp. You don't get to lie about religion. You don't get to lie about and abuse religious people. That's one of the many things we're about here on Red Pill Religion. On Red Pill Religion, please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. We uh, are hoping to have maker support up by the end of this weekend. In the meantime, we still take your Bitcoin and PayPal donations. We have le- left the unethical Patreon site, um, uh, but we do need your 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 financial as well as spiritual support. Redpillreligion.com will redirect to escapingatheism.com by no- for now. That is still us, but we're hoping to have a change in the works pretty quick, pretty quickly. So joining us tonight are, we've actually got quite a panel here and this could be fun. I'm actually going to struggle a little bit not to talk and to let other people talk because we've got so many people on the stream here. Um, we are going to be addressing a, a Richard Carrier. And uh, I, I wanted to note that uh, someone we had slightly befriended, although she may be mad at me because I got really mad at her the other night, but it, uh, Shannon Q had sent me a message that Richard Carrier had invited me to come talk to him. Uh, and I will only say I was busy that day, but uh, Dr. Carrier, you know how to reach us if you want to. Um, if you want to talk to me or anyone on this team, we don't walk into Pounce interviews. We did that once before with an atheist who goes by the name of Medicare when we were just trying to be honest to the historical record about certain things. We don't do that again. If you want to talk to one of us, you let us know when, you let us know where, you make sure we're able to make a recording of it so that you can't hide the recording. This is a problem that a lot of people in your little cult community do. And yes, it is a cult community. Um, And we, we could talk. And we can just talk. But I would tell you, Mr. Carrier, and your friend Shannon, that uh, truly it is our position, and we will be happy to back this up in any court of law, anywhere, um, or, or before any audience. You're a fraud and a liar, a professional fraud. I once made the slight mistake uh, on a previous podcast with uh, Stephanie Thomason, Professor Stephanie Thomason, of uh, saying that I thought his that, that Carrier's degree was from an obscure source. And Carrier's Carriers, meat, and sock puppets jumped on that. The funny thing is, I had said, I don't know that it's a particularly good school. Uh, within seconds, uh, Dr. Thomason came back and said, no, he's from Columbia. That's a good school. It's a very good school. I'm like, okay, sorry, I stand corrected. I'm sorry that Dr. Carrier has besmirched the reputation of Columbia. I would also add, by the way, that I have friends with degrees from places like Harvard and Yale, so I do you know, ask forgiveness for not remembering that Columbia is an okay school, too. I'm not impressed with you, Carrier, and I'm certainly not impressed with your credentials, and nobody should be. There's nothing impressive about you. Uh, I will note that having spoken to multiple historians, um, not just multiple academics familiar with you, um, you're a pseudo-scholar, sir, a pseudo-scholar pumping out fake information for a living, and you are a hate propagandist. So this isn't going to be a pleasant exchange, and just so you know, if we ever were to speak in person, I would call you a hate propagandist to your face. I would tell you that you have made life worse for my children. Um, you, you are you and the hate propaganda campaign that you and some of your co-religionists, your co-cultists runs, has created an intolerant a climate of intolerance and violence even toward Christians that is not in any way funny. And if you ever wanted any respect for me, uh, there would only be one thing I would ever want you to do, which is openly renounce hatred and uh, abuse and uh, violence toward Christians, say it's wrong, and call out actors within the atheist community who do those things. I do not believe you will do that uh, because I believe you're a wicked, evil man. And I believe your fans come in two varieties. Um, Morons um, who don't understand real skepticism and don't know how to call you on your bullshit, and filthy hate mongers like yourself. And I will repeat the phrase, filthy hate monger, Dr. Richard Carrier, who got his degree at Columbia and who besmirched the entire institution of Columbia with that degree um, because you're not qualified to talk about most of the things you talk about. I will point out an interview I did with one person who knows exactly what the deal is with people like you, Borden Painter, former president of Trinity College, former head of its, 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 its history department, now uh, retired, but with a chair in his name, um, who has published in some of the most distinguished 
uh, historical peer-reviewed journals in the world. You yourself, most of the public claims that you make, most of them you would never be able to get past a respectable peer-reviewed journal. Although as everybody knows, like sociology, history, and quite a few other fields are filled with bogus so-called peer-reviewed journals. Um, but in reality, you're a joke. You might as well have gotten that PhD at some state college in the middle of the country. You're no better. You're not even qualified, according to sources I've seen, to speak of ancient history. Um, the, the historical methods you're trained in and that, that you work with render you in no way qualified to talk about ancient history like 2,000 years ago. Uh, simply put, sir, you're a fraud, and anybody who gives you money is giving money to a con artist. Now, I, don't, I would say happily say this to, all, and to your face. I happily say this to your fans. Um, you actively make people stupid, and you actively make this world a worse place. Um, you're a horrible, horrible person. Um, and I don't apologize for that. And if Shannon Q is listening, um, while I suspect that uh, we won't be seeing her again because people in your network would abuse her if she ever renounced her atheism, I'm going to bet right now that Shannon now actually does believe that there is substantial evidence for a God in an afterlife because we forced her to look at it and no sane person could deny that evidence, scientifically or otherwise. Um, you're in a cult in what's, what's worse is that you're in a cult that hurts people who try to leave it. I know I'm one of your cult's victims and you like lying about people who apostatize out of your atheist hate cult. I've talked to many other victims of your hate cult. It is a cult. It's sometimes called the skeptic mafia, uh, by people within it or who left it. It's not a formal title, of course, but, uh, in any case, I, I expect no honest answers from anything from you or anyone in your circle because you're a filthy hate monger, a professional hate monger who has blood money, blood on his hands. You know, you got your 30 pieces of silver. I hope you're happy. Um, you're vile. Your fans are vile. And if you have friends, they're vile. But I don't think you have friends. I think you only have people you use and people who use you because that is also typical for your atheist hate cult. Now. One of the things that Dr. Carrier does, and I'm about to wind or start up here and bring people in to bring their own perspectives, um, but one of the things is, is that um, Carrier is guilty in general of what I would call gish galloping. The term gish gallop was invented to describe creationist Dwayne Gish, who's not a particularly honest or particularly admirable Christian that I can see, um, and he's certainly kind of dumb. But one of the ways that Dwayne Gish would win debates was by throwing out 50 points at once. And that by the time you caught up to him with one point, he'd made three, four more others and could even shift at least switch the subject. Um, you know, it's basically you just put out a torrent of assertions and then people try to keep it all up, keep up with it all can't. Um, even though most of the assertions are bullshit or easily debunked. And frankly, Richard Carrier, that's what you do for a living. You're a professional atheist. Dwayne, uh, uh, Gish Galloper. It's all you are. It is why your little movement is dying. Um, you know, it must have seemed about really exciting 10 years ago. Oh, you were all the young people who were going to change the world. And now nobody can stand you any more than they could stand you 10 years ago. It's just now you've helped make it more popular to hate on and abuse and even sometimes beat up Christians. And I will repeat, I do hold you responsible for Christians getting physically assaulted, even if you never actually advocated that. And even if you go on a self-righteous tirade saying, I would never. Yeah, no, you're vile. I've met neo-Nazis and communists I like better than you and your fans. I mean that too. It's not rhetoric. You're horrible. Okay, so that said, <laughs> Just to set the appropriate tone for tonight, I do advise by everybody, by the way, to go and read, board, uh, go and listen to this interview I did, Borden Painter, Atheist Pedal Fake History, and that whole playlist. He does mention one of his encounters in the peer-reviewed journals with the utterly incompetent and disingenuous Dr. Carrier, um, who I will repeat again, in my opinion, just completely besmirches the name of Columbia every time he opens his mouth. Please also read uh, Dr. Borden Painter's book, The New Atheist Denial of History. While Carrier only has a small role in that, the book, the book really does show how the hate cult movement that started in the whole new atheism thing 10 years ago was really a crock from the beginning. And it was always political and it was always based on fake history and fake science. Um, and I'll, I'll repeat that fake science charge, by the way. Your cohort, Richard Dawkins, is demonstrably a pseudoscientist. Um, so, 
here we go. Uh, I've mentioned all the sources I wanted and got all that off my chest. Now I'm going to do my best to not talk and let other individuals talk. Joining us today, just to introduce everybody, is a classical theist who has his own YouTube channel and does, it is, I believe, aren't you a former atheist too, classical theist? Yeah, that, uh, that's correct. I was an atheist for a few years, yeah. Well, I'm glad you smartened up faster than I did. Uh, it took me like, that was one for decades. And uh, uh, yeah. yeah, now now you're Catholic, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I've been Catholic for a while. Uh, okay, by the way, for any, anybody who wants to know, for the record, everybody, this is not a Catholic apologist site. It's not even a Catholic channel, although there's a lot of Catholics around here. We got Anglicans, we got Eastern Orthodox, we got Protestants, we got Jews, we got pagan theists, we got witches, we got all kinds of people here. Um, and all united in one thing, we're sick of atheist bullying and atheist pseudo-scholarship. Um, so, uh, also, Mathoma, also a former atheist, also now not one, and a mathematician, right? Well, the wannabe mathematician, but yeah, an ex-atheist as well. Another ex-atheist, yep. Uh, there's a lot of that around, and by the way, statistically, about two out of three people leave atheism long-term. It is a lie of Dr. Carrier's cult that it's rare for people to leave atheism. Most people leave atheism. Uh, okay, finally, also joining us is our friend White Engine, who has his own, actually, everybody here's got a YouTube channel except one of us. Uh, 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 White Engine, how you doing tonight, White Engine? Hola. And uh, all, he calls himself a secular theist, and I love that title. Um, and finally, a uh, member of the Red Pill Religion team, the, the sick Protestant bastard who we will have to torture to death one of these days. Say hello, Philosophy Tiger. Hi, everybody. Abomination in the room here. I'm proud of it. And if you're going to torture me, please make it with garlic butter. I need to be, it needs to be nice and tasty. Hey, you're back to the Green Tiger. He's been changing his uh, avatar lately. Uh, you like Green Tiger when you talk and the cool, cloudy, uh, vapory uh, tiger otherwise. Huh, that's interesting. So, okay, so that's everybody on the team. And by the way, I'm going to repeat this is not a Christian apologetic show. We've been a little Christian apolog – we've been a little lousy with Christians lately, uh, uh, you know, lousy with – We've had a lot of them, but in fact, I want to remind everybody, we really do. We got a rabbi comes in here regularly. We talk with him. We got a witch comes in here. We talk with him. We got lots of people. Every, you don't have to be Christian to be part of this. And actually, I would assert, and we're about to begin, and who's going to go first again? Who's going to go first? What were we I, would like to, I would like to set the tone by dealing with cons consensus. That way, people know what the consensus of scholarship is on the historicity of Jesus. You know what? Let's put Jesus toward the end just because we have been a little Christian centric here. And it's, it's possible to go after carrier on, uh, on grounds that any religious person ought to be able to take <clears throat> down. Um, so Matt and I, yeah, I, I think so. We're going to go with the Facer's five proofs of the existence of God debunked. Is that, that's what you guys. Yeah, that's his art. Right? Right? Uh, just to just to just to set it up for the audience, uh, Ed Facer has published a book which everybody really ought to read called Five Proofs of God. Um, since for years and years and years, atheists have been lying and saying there's no evidence, there's no proof. Uh, that, of course, is always a horseshit. There has always been evidence and there has always been proofs. Um, but Facer's done an excellent job of of taking some of the more uh, the solid proofs. And by the way, there's more than five. But he's taken some of the more five, created five in, in, you know, kind of a modern synthesis. And it's undeniably a very good book and also undeniably a book you can't refute. Certainly a book that uh, Dr. Facer, I, I hate to call him Dr. Facer. I don't believe he deserves to be called by that title. I really don't. Um, but, okay. Carrier you mean Dr. Carrier? <laughs> Carrier has debunked, supposedly, Ed Facer's book. Um, take it away, Mathoma and Classical Theist. Yeah, w one thing we should point out, too, is that what the book defends is not even Christianity. What Fazer's trying to defend in this book is a broad, what we would say, a classical theist or a philosophical theist point of view, which is, we would argue, quite common to the great religious tradition. So it's not even a Christian. It's not a, it's not a defense of Christianity. It's just a defense of a broad philosophical theism, which we believe we can establish through natural reason alone. There's no appeals to scripture. No appeals to divine revelation or special revelation or anything yeah. of the sort. I mean, two of the thinkers were pagans. <laughs> yep, Plotinus. And, I got, and um, Aristotle, too. Yeah, yeah, Aristotle and Plotinus in there. They certainly mm -hmm. weren't Christians. So. 
Yeah. So um, perhaps I could say one thing that I actually like about uh, Richard Carrier's um, that's he seems to agree that on the main principle that there has to be a first principle, something from which everything else is derived. Um, in his in his article, he seems to think that he has a bizarre proposal, and we'll get into that perhaps. That this first principle, this unactualized actualizer prime mover, is supposed to be space time itself. But one thing I do like about his article is that he seems to concede the main point there, and this is mostly what is established by Phaser in the first. Uh, I, would, I guess I would say that first half of each of the arguments is that Where's there has it? to be a prime mover, or an unactualized actualizer, or a necessary being, or something of this sort. Does, does, wait a minute. Does Carrier say that? Well, he has yeah, a proposal. Carrier, where, yeah. Yep. Let me find it. I'll pull it up. Um, that's because that's interesting. I haven't been able to get. Yeah. Uh, if you um, let's see. Oh, so I propose that the substrate of all potential. Okay, is this him? I propose that the substrate right. of all potentiality is the actualization of space time. Just that, nothing more. Yeah. Okay. So he right. he does seem to concede that you do have to. Uh, whittle it down to at least one first principle. One first principle upon which everything sort of depends. But he's really messy about how he defines it. And I, I guess well, yeah, I think, he just, I think he just weaseled out there. I'll have to go back and look at it. But I propose that the substrate of all potentiality is the actualization of space-time. Just that, nothing more. I've made the case for this elsewhere already in his Sense and Goodness Without God, an epic failure of a book. He said, I don't claim it's true. Well, okay. He's got a proposal and does... Okay, go ahead. I read it. Go ahead and make your comments. Right. So he concedes to that point that there has to be an unactualized actualizer, which is the conclusion of the first segment of the of what Phaser calls the Aristotelian proof for it's also based on a motion that from the reduction of potency to act, we're led through a series of deductions where the reduction of potency to act is done through a concurrent actualizer. And this infinite regress cannot proceed ad infinitum, it has to terminate with something which is not itself brought from potency to act, which we call, by various names, an unactualized actualizer, an unmoved mover or prime mover. So Carrier seems to think that there is something of this sort. The, the point where he's confused is that he thinks that the unactualized actualizer can be something which is a physical reality. It can be something yeah. which is extended in, in character. It can be something that changes. Well, one of the things that he said that really baffles me is he said that um, p potentials, since the potentiality is since it exists, doesn't need to be actualized. But I mean, that completely uh, misses the point. I mean, the, the, the point is that actuality has to precede potentiality. Potentialities have to be grounded in actuality. That's essential to the argument itself, that of course potentialities can't... Um, that of course they have to be grounded in actuality, but it's silly to say that if I have, for example, the potential to be uh, five feet ahead of where I am now, um, that that potential, uh, it, it's silly to say that that just exists so it doesn't need to be actualized because clearly I'm not five feet from where I need to be if I wanted to go five feet ahead of where I am now. That That being five feet ahead from where I am now, that doesn't have actual existence it has to be actualized by me walking five feet ahead of me so i mean that that that's i have no idea why he he said that i mean that that's completely missing the point here's what yeah, i think well go ahead yeah the, one interesting thing about a lot of these stock objections is that um people in the 13th century uh, most notably saint thomas aquinas addressed a lot of this stuff already namely the yeah. asymmetry there between potency and act that there isn't just a potential just sitting out there all by itself uh, potency is directed at actualization so as aquinas might say absolutely speaking act is prior logically prior to potency so there has to be at the end of the day there has to be something which is an unactualized actualizer but uh, well, one interesting thing to point out about um well actually one un unfortunate thing that you see in a lot of these hyperbolic uh, brain dropping responses um <laughs> such as carriers is that in the aristotelian proof it's not even just this proof, but each of the five proofs, he can't manage to even state what the argument even is correctly. Like if we okay. read what he says about the Aristotelian proof, he says, quote, a quick and dirty way to phrase this argument is change is real. 
change requires some fundamental underlying substrate, a word that um, Phaser doesn't actually use, an ultimate, quote, causey thing, which is certainly something that Phaser doesn't use, that makes change possible. Ergo, there has to be God. That has to be God. Yeah. So th this is nowhere near a correct phrasing of what the argument even is. So right off the right off the bat, we're starting with a straw man uh, yeah, cartoon. Yeah, else said, oh argument. my gosh, it's 35 premises, therefore it can't be true. Yeah. Like, I, I look at this too, and when I look at it and then analyze what he's saying, um, the substrate of all potentiality is the actualization of space-time. Where this would land him is more or less some sort of pantheist. If I if I read it correctly, right. yeah, it's, it's kind of an emergentist kind of view of God. You know, yeah. I, I I would go yeah. so far as to say that he does. I mean, his uh, conception of space time as the first principle. I would go so far as to call him uh, a sort of a sort of theist. I mean, he he's, he's he, his position is kind of indistinguishable from what you would find in pre-Socratic theology. I mean, in a certain way that 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 is. Um, a theism of a sort, even though it's incredibly debased. Um, I mean, he, he for example, uh, he tries to argue that space-time is quote-unquote incorporeal. He says it is not itself a body, but by itself the absence of all body. Um, he says it's immaterial, quote-unquote, in, uh, in that it isn't made of matter, nor does it exist in space or time. It's immutable, quote unquote. Um, uh, but he, at the same time, he says space time can change in quantity and shape and thereby manifest different things. But every bit of it is always the same as every other bit of it. Its ultimate properties never change, just as God can think and feel and then act, while his ultimate properties never change. That is a complete misreading of uh, what we mean by God, first and foremost, because. Yep. We, we, we wouldn't say that God thinks this and then thinks that, or he does this and then does that, um, because we have this conception of his uh, providence being ultimately uh, eternal. And he doesn't have properties in and of themselves distinct from one another that can't change. He, in totality, is unchangeable. And that's certainly not the case with space-time. He admits here that space-time... Uh, it, it changes in quantity and shape. Well, if it changes from quantity and shape, that first of all means it cannot be absolutely simple, which he tries to say it can be absolutely simple. And at the same time, uh, change in quantity and shape. If it changes in quantity and shape, first of all, that presupposes that there is one intelligible or discernible aspect of it as opposed to other aspects of it, other quantitative aspects of it that undergo change while others don't. Well, that obviously means that there are that, that space-time is, in that sense, composite, because parts of it are an act, others are not an act. Parts of it are uh, actualized in this way, parts of it are actualized in this other way, or not actualized at all. Um, so sure. that uh, completely fails. Um, it, it, it doesn't match up to what he's trying to say, that space-time, and, and he hasn't refuted the, uh, the arguments enough uh, to where that can't be a problem for it. He concedes too much of the argument for his own good, it seems. Let's, uh, we do have to do, hit a couple of other topic areas, but let's just say that pretty much here, I read this as a concession that there is a God, he's just a pantheist. Um, and otherwise, it's, it's apparent that he misrepresents um, other people's, he misrepresents the arguments for God. In fact, I'm pretty sure uh, yeah. if you go check uh, Ed, Fazer, Ed Fazer's response, which we should have in the low bar as well, he just points this out. Um, uh, misrepresenting the the inform you know the other side is is a classic uh, atheist move, ideological atheist move. You know, the, from the, this new atheist cult movement that he was such a part of when he was after he came out of Columbia, and I'm sure before that, um, misrepresenting that just as he misrepresents the Bible, it's demonstrable that he does that. It misrepresents what Christians believe, it's demonstrable that he does that. He misrepresents history in a way that really ought to have people at Columbia wondering if his PhD shouldn't be removed. I mean, they, they probably can't just because his public statements aren't, you know, it's just like the way Bertrand Russell lied on his uh, why I'm not a Christian thing. He didn't put it up for peer review or say it was scholarly, but oh my God, misrepresenting things is what this man does for a living. And I think he's starting to even, even his fans are probably starting to figure it out. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, man, another sorry thing. If I, I sound mean, but really, I, I this this man has been like this for years. I'm sorry. What? Yeah. You know, another thing he misrepresents too. Uh, Carrier, he's a bit of a dilettante with several of these topics. So he thinks he can do a little bit of theology. He could say a little bit about the cutting edge. Yeah. He, thinks he's an, he thinks he's an expert in everything. One thing. Yeah, one, one thing he, mis he misrepresents and it's central to his proposal, he thinks that this um, uh, mutation in space-time giving rise to different objects is a good representation of what super string theory says. What he, He's totally confused here. He, he's mixed two different fields of physics. He's, he, he seems to think that confirmations of space-time itself or vibrations of space-time themselves give rise to many different things. That's something that comes from gravitational waves, like distortions in space-time itself. But he's confused that with what string theory attempts to say, which is that fundamental particles just are different modes or vibrations of strings. So he can't even actually, he can't even represent what string theory is even saying here. So he's a bit of a dilettante on physics too. Yep. Uh, uh, now we're going to go ahead and move on to another topic. But I did want to add one thing that kind of helps explain this. This man's personal ideology, um, and he, he, he the, the phrase he uses to describe himself is metaphysical naturalism. Now, I will merely point out that metaphysical naturalism, indeed most, uh, as well as scientific naturalism and other variations on materialism, uh, these are garbage philosophies. Um, he's embraced metaphysical mat naturalism, which means he has turned off large parts of his mind and he no longer can think like a normal human being because naturalism itself is based on materialism and materialism has been bunked so many times, it's ridiculous. I'm sorry, Carrier, but reality does not reduce to uh, that which is physical, that which is subject to the laws of physics. In fact, it's quite demonstrable that a number of things that we all consider real are not subject to the laws of physics at all. They don't follow the four forces um, and they are outside the scope of, of, of scientific naturalism. And we have ample current science even that shows that uh, odds are your mind is uh, more than electrochemical effects. If you're, a, if you're a metaphysical naturalist, you pretty much have to believe your mind is nothing but wiring in electrochemistry. Um, and we've got copious science showing that that cannot possibly be true. So your whole worldview in that regard is garbage, just like all the others you work with. Uh, on that, on, on the on the hate movement called New Atheism, the hate propaganda movement called New Atheism. This is also true, by the way, of Daniel Dennett, who is probably the most impressive among the horrible wave of cheap, low-life atheists like Hitchens, Harris, and Dawkins. Dennett is probably the one who's who's got the finest mind and the best scientific background, and even he puts out tons of pseudoscience, demonstrable pseudoscience. Yeah, just that's saying something. On. Yeah, yeah, really. It does say something. The only one I know who's not guilty of peddling pseudoscience is Stephen Hawking. Um, all the rest are. Jerry Coyne certainly is. Uh, Lawrence Krauss certainly is a, a pseudoscience peddler. These people, all, all these people, all these big name atheists deal in pseudoscience and pseudo history. And I'll put, the, I'll back that up in any court Dr. Carrier wants to go, go into if it's a legal court. I could even back that up in UK libel court. I dare you to try me. Um, um, I would love to get sued by a carrier, um, but in any case, um, fraud is what he is. Now, that said, uh, we, we're going to get to some of the more specific, Christian specific first, but I want to go ahead with Injun and and address the sexual the the sexual allegations against him. And I'm going to surprise some people with what I have to say. Uh, Doctor Carrier, you may have a friend in me in some way. After all, you might be shocked, but. Uh, I want to hear from Injun. Uh, what's your? Su you've given us a few weeks. What are the summary of the the the, the horrible, uh, weird behavior, sexual behavior, and hangups supposedly of Dr. Carrier? On the whole, I think that Carrier is a fairly vile human being. His sex life is his own business, but the fact that he leached off of his then wife for years, then cheated on her, and tried to pass this off as coming out as polyamorous is pretty disgusting. Then there's the fact that he preached to others <clears throat> about listening to women who say they have been sexually harassed and declared zero tolerance on harassment in the atheist movement. And then when he was accused himself, he declared that the women in question were liars, like he does with the majority of his critics. Suggested they had mental health issues and then slapped a $2 million lawsuit for damages to his reputation. The guy's a maggot. 
Although, though, all that has nothing to do with his weak thesis and flawed arguments. Well, it can and it can't if it's true. Um, the the thing about coming out as polyamorous for some of the behavior is 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 really pretty okay. Whatever, dude. You're polyamorous, which means you like to get your freak on with a lot of people. That doesn't. But um, within atheist land, I must point out who are who's putting some of these articles out. Stephanie Zvon, a truly vile feminist bigot. Um, very typical among the, the skeptics and stuff who are just horrible, horrible women. Uh, uh, I've seen this guy Yeti before, uh, who also says, uh, Carrier is a creepy, dishonest hypocrite. I will give dishonest hypocrite, but only on, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I'm mostly, I, I'm concerned with his, you know, weird, uh, philosophical naturalism, which is garbage and his law, his outright misrepresentation in you know, of history. Um, but I don't know that we should trust the opinions of Yeti. I've had run-ins with guys with that guy before. Um, uh, Rebecca Watson, probably one of the most hideously abusive, dishonest, shallow feminists and atheists on the internet, uh, uh, herself, uh, easy to show that she makes things up and may well be, uh, there, there's no reason not to believe that Rebecca Watson wouldn't would never falsely accuse somebody um, because you know she she's that kind of feminist and by the way I am not a feminist I am a men's rights advocate actually I never stopped being one uh, 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 and I've been watching both the atheist feminists and the atheists who aren't feminists for some time one of the reasons I'm no longer atheist is because I realized how horrible atheism seemed to turn a human being um, I, so again, I'm impeaching Rebecca Watson as a source, and I know this whole creepy, especially the left side of the atheist community, you know, those who didn't flee it during the great atheism fuss, plus schism fiasco, uh, those who stayed in, you've got a lot of people who are really good at making false allegations against innocent people. And, and, and Carrier was part of, part of atheism plus. Who was? Carrier was part yeah, of Carrier was Plus. one of the spearheads of the the horrific Atheism Plus, actually, um, where he the you know, intellectual artil artillery, as he says, yes, the intellectual artillery. And um, <laughs> I, I it, it, well, if by artillery you means out scream your opponents and gish gallop your opponents and demonize your opponents, then he's good at that. Um, well, he's but, absolutely yeah, good at that, and he's yeah. good at. My and he's good at marketing himself, which is why he has so many people convinced that he's some mighty scholar when he's just an unemployed blogger. Now, speaking of speaking as a sexual abuse survivor who worked with sexual abuse survivors for many, many, many years and has spoken to many top flight researchers and clinical workers who deal with victims of, of sexual abuse and such like that, um, real victims, real survivors uh, despise false accusers and real victims and real so, so, uh, uh, real survivors know there are false accusers and hate them because a false allegation of rape and sexual assault is often worse than actually experiencing the sexual assault. And yeah, by the way, I just said as somebody who's a survivor uh, and has worked with survivors, yeah, false accusers are often as bad as rapists, um, sometimes arguably worse. Um, and so you know, I, I, I'm willing to believe quite, given what I've seen about how atheists, the, these ideological atheists, these anti-theists get together in packs, they all got together, uh, you know, in this movement thing that wasn't a movement, and uh, atheists always turn on each other and always wind up hating each other. It's just a scientifically observable fact. So I don't know who to believe in all of this. And, uh, you know, I really do believe... Uh, Multiple women, if they, especially if they were all part of the atheist community, which is full of really squirrely, nutty, sleazy people, I, I, I totally believe you could get three atheist women to falsely accuse Dr. Carrier. I totally believe that without a second thought, because especially well, if the right cash is involved, and if people well, don't like him, they'll pay false accusers, and yes, false accusers do get paid. Now, Carrier may not like my defense, but all of this is possible. Well... As for me, I can't seem to shake the suspicion that Carrier does things such as suing people who accuse him of sexual harassment, either because he's a sex addict who genuinely can't help it, or because his annual income is dismally low, which it is, last I checked. He's a again, perpetual, I will, a again, I will defend him. Huh? A, 
a perpetually unemployed blogger who whines and cries when he gets corrected and or ignored by real professionals like Bart Ehrman in them and throws a tantrum on his shitty blogs and trash talks them. You're allowed to have that opinion. I'll take the, 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 the alternate opinion and even off to offer to talk to him off the record about this and give him advice if he wants it, uh, because I've talked to a lot of people who've been falsely accused, and uh, it truly is hideous and awful. And frankly, just the allegation alone, even if the allegations are unproven, is enough to destroy a man's career. Uh -oh. it's enough, it's a, no, let me just finish. It's enough to drive a man. I'm not saying he's innocent. I am merely noting factually, a false allegation is enough to drive a man to suicide. A false allegation will often completely destroy his career, his ability to make income. In fact, ideological atheists that Carrier has met personally have helped do those things to me. Um, and I don't appreciate it, but it's happened a lot. Um, and they are still also, doing it, by the way. They're still doing it because, you know, no matter how much I make it clear that my family's getting harassed and that it's, that it's, that, that it's, it's, it, that I don't even like being called by my legal name, they all insist on doing it. And they all insist on quoting me out of context to make me look more monstrous than I am. And I believe they do this because they want somebody to hurt me. I, I also, some? Yeah, I just, I wanted to make it very, very clear that. Uh, in the case of of sexual assault and sexual harassment and stuff like that uh, toward uh, Richard Carrier, as much as I do not like the guy, I really don't, I will suspend judgment in, in good faith on this kind of stuff. Because this kind of, like, we've seen allegations, we ha we've seen people receive more allegations of, of sexual assault, sometimes 30 people make it up. It's happened before, and this is just three. So we gotta be very, very careful on this. If there, uh, one of the biggest things we also have to realize, um, none, of, none of the people in there are saying they went and um, got a rape kit if he raped them, or they don't have any audio if it was just sexual harassment. There's no, they haven't, they didn't go to the police. There, there's not, there's, there, it, it just seems to be, it really seems to be monkeys throwing shit into a fan and seeing what sticks. Yes. Um, I, 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 I but, don't think it's wrong. I actually think that we need to ch challenge the entire current feminist paradigm, which Richard used to promote i hope he's stopped by now because really no, he, hasn't he hasn't stopped feminism is awful richard you ought to just admit that feminism is awful because it is um everybody hates it men men hate it women hate it children hate it everybody hates feminism you should too um but, but uh, the, the bayesian problem I quote a feminist i have i have i have inter i've you know had dealings with who i actually do admire wendy mcelroy wendy mcelroy who famous said Women lie about rape, men lie about rape, people lie about rape. Um, so it, I actually think that if, if Carrier truly is innocent, he ought to be not only screaming that they're lying at the top of his lungs, but he ought to be suing. Um, uh, because really, we're not going to end the climate of false allegations and this sort of public witch hunt until false accusers are confronted. Now, I'm not saying his accusers are false. I don't know that. Although I did help Ben Radford. You might remember Ben Radford's name, Dr. Carrier. I did help him personally on, a, on what I believed was almost certainly totally false allegations because I thought Radford had all the evidence to show that he was uh, 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 innocent. And I, and, I, and I said I helped him publicly. He never said thank you. That was a typical atheist trait. Well, um, the, the Bayesian probability of everything I just said is extremely high. I just thought, thinking, you, might enjoy, thought you might enjoy that one. I'm not going. I'm not going to argue with you. Actually, I'm making statements of principles here. Um, it's clear to me that that he's in a community of people that are into all kinds of wild, kiki sex, which is another thing that is typical, by the way, as anybody who's gone to atheist meetings can verify. Most atheists are into wild, kinky, weird sex stuff and polyamory or gay or. Uh, they don't like to admit it, but a, a substantial cohort among them have a thing for kids, which is why they like to attack Christians for that. Um, the, the you know, I know all the dirty dirt on the inside of the, of the atheist community. There, Richard, I, I was an atheist for an awful long time, and I've talked to a lot of ex-atheists, and I've been watching you guys for a long time. A lot of us have. 
Um, so I hope you're, it is at least not as guilty as it's made, made to look out, but you might want to consider that the, the lifestyle choices you've made and the ideological choices you've made have led you to disaster. Note that I did not just threaten any hellfire on you, just look at it from a, from, from a clinical, rational perspective. How much is the ideological beliefs you have and your behavior and the people you've chosen to associate with led you to where you are now? Do you ever think maybe you should rethink your approach to life in some way? Um, all right. Now, not everybody's going to be happy with that, but that's what I had to say. Um, uh, I, I, I still do think it ultimately he's chosen to be part of a community and a lifestyle that is inherently dysfunctional, destructive, you know, polyamory, please. It's inherently, inherently unhealthy. And I'll back that up to anybody who wants me to. It's demonstrably unstable and high risk of disease and high risk of dysfunctional relationships. I've watched polyamorous relationships. I've watched polyamorous people brag about how great that it is and how enlightened they are. And they're all so happy. And the majority of I've encountered that by the time they hit late middle age, they, they have relationships that have ended in complete destruction and they're utterly miserable. And most of them regret that they chose to live that way. That, that sexually profligate lifestyle. Um, again, notice not a religious word just came out of my mouth, sir. Uh, so, um, I, but I, I just think it says something about this whole CD atheist industry, this whole atheist cult movement. Come on! Filled with this sort of thing. And I don't just mean here. I, I'll mention I'll mention an I, I I helped Ben Radford, who was an atheist, part of that community, because I thought he was innocent. He was being accused by a squirrely woman who looked like she just wanted money and fame, and that's it. Um, but you look at you look at the people at Freethought blogs and 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 like I remember uh, the Free Thought blogs guys. We ran an article about this on a Voice for Men. Then we should move on. We ran about an article about this on the Voice for Men. Free Thought blogs had led the charge, saying that any man accused should be, you know, assumed guilty until proven innocent because the rape issue is just so bad out there. Uh, but then, within the, within the course of a year or so, not less than four of them, PZ Myers, uh, something like I think, did he go by? I can't remember what he went by. Four of them, Myers among them himself among them, came out with their own stories about how they were once falsely accused and how they dealt with it and how they overcame the false allegation. Uh, in other words, and, and what they described doing was like making recordings and reporting things immediately and immediately saying, no, she's lying. You know, all the things that men's rights activists would uh, advise you to do if you're falsely accused. But sure, all was of them had. And these are all men who had said that a, a man who is accused should be assumed guilty. Um, because the rape issue is just so bad and women aren't taken seriously, supposedly. Um, and yet within a year or two, at least four of their number came out and admitted to being, <laughs> or claimed to be victims of false accusations. Sharma um, wasn't another one of them. Right, yeah, which means statistically, you should just assume at least three out of four of them probably are lying and were guilty because it's so rare for a woman to lie. Uh, you know, statistically, maybe one of them, but four? No, wait a minute. Um, you know, it, it really does look like a seedy, filthy group of backstabbers with no principles, no morals, and completely obsessed with sex. That's what the entire, at the top, I mean, going all the way up to people like Penn Jillette and Michael Shermer, um, just people who are obsessed with crazy kinky sex all the time and angry that the rest of the world doesn't want to do that with them. I'll tell you what, though, when I was an atheist, I never wanted to live that way. Probably one of the reasons I was uh, I was always uncomfortable with this crowd. Um, but okay, now what was the last thing we were going to cover? Ty oh yes, now we get to the part which yeah. might be called Christian apologetics. No, we've done none of that so far. Um, but uh, let's bring up. Uh, uh, oh yes, yes, yes. Jesus mythicism. Now we could now. Of course, again, whenever Carrier indulges in his pseudo-historical uh, Jesus mythicism, he always just gallops through everything. So pinning him down on many things is very, very, very difficult. But we did find a letter uh, on Aaron Ra's channel. Oh, by the way, tomorrow we're going to 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 give a similar treatment to Aaron Ra. So you might want to tune into that. I've been waiting for an opportunity to go after that guy. Um, but... Uh, uh, this is Dr. Richard Carrier on the mythical Jesus. Um, 
and I won't say much about it except that I consider it rather, uh, it's solipsistic sophistry from a so-called historian who is actually not qualified to comment on ancient history in the way that he does most of the time. Um, but here's the book you wanted to talk about, Tiger, right? Uh, the Resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. By a, the, this is a secular source. A no, it's... No, it's not a secular source. Okay. It's, uh, it cites secular sources, and it cites them very honestly. Uh, and I, one, I do want to apologize. There are people that open my room, and whew, I had to let someone have it because I told them not to. Um, and uh, But anyways, so I want to apologize openly for that. Uh, but basically... Uh, Michael Lacona is one of the top scholars that deals with the resurrection. Uh, but within, within the source material that he uses, he actually cites uh, secular scholars. So I'm going to bring that up. I'm going to bring up secular scholars, the year that the, that the quotation was published. And within this book, there is, a mul there is at least 30 pages of bibliography which means a lot of research went into it. It's over 700 pages long. It's uh, published by IVP Academic, which is one of the top Christian uh, publishing uh, houses out there. You can't just get into it. You actually have to be very qualified, and you have to have a very good pedigree. Um, so that being said, um, the first thing we're going to go with is C.A. Evans who states, quote, no serious historian of any, uh, re any religious or non-religious stripe doubts that, G that Jesus of Nazareth really lived in the first century and was executed under the authority of Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea and Samaria. Uh, continuing on, uh, G. Verms, who said, he states in 2008, um, let me state plainly that I accept that Jesus was a real historical person. In my opinion, uh, the difficulties arising from the denial of his existence still uh, viseriously, whatever, uh, maintain in a, in a small uh, in small circles of rationalist dogmatists far exceed those deriving from its acceptance. Uh, then it go, then we have, um, let's see, we have L.P. Meyer who states the total evidence is so overpowering that so absolute, so, so absolute that only the shallowest of intellects would dare to deny Jesus's existence. Uh, uh, Burridge and Gold state, quote, uh, there are those who argue that Jesus is a figment of uh, the church's imagination, that there was never a, uh, a Jesus at all. I have to say that I, uh, that I do not know any respectable critical scholar who says that anymore. Um, and I will go with the last one, which is R.E. Uh, von Vroost, who says contemporary uh, New Testament scholars ha have uh, typically viewed their, i.e. Jesus Mithers arguments to, as so weak or bizarre that they relegate them to footnotes or often ignore them completely. I think uh, uh, I think the last one that's really interesting in nineteen uh, in nineteen fifty eight is from uh, Doctor Boltman, who says, "Of course, the doubt as to whether Jesus really existed is un uh, is unfounded and is not worth refutation. No sane person can uh, doubt that Jesus stands as founder behind uh, the his the historical movement, whose first distinct stage." is represented by the oldest Palestinian community. I mean, the, it's, it's very simple uh, to Richard Carrier. One, none, none of the serious scholars that deal with the historical Jesus and, his con and, the, and the world around him 
take you seriously. None of them. There is, there is no, one. No. There is one. No, no, no serious one. No, I said no. no serious one. I didn't make his point. The, the, oh. the, the only Christ mentor who's a, who, the only Christ mentor who's an actual Bible scholar is Price. Robert well, Price. The, the thing, well, the thing about Robert Price too is still he doesn't make any good arguments. None. Like I say, there he's not really considered a serious scholar on this matter. But there's one thing I have to say about uh, about Richard Price. He himself does uh, consider the Zeitgeist movie where they where that culminated into this Christ Christ mythicist movement in the in the 21st century. He pretty much called it bunk, and that's very interesting coming from him because he he does, he has no axe to grind against it. Um, he is he is a, so, he's a nice guy though. Uh, well, you know, nice guy or not a nice guy, it doesn't matter. For example, I, you know, I pretty much yelled at someone coming into my room. <laughs> I, you know, that doesn't negate the fact that, uh, of, it doesn't negate the evidence I'm presenting here. So I'm not the nicest of people myself. But when it comes down to it, uh, there's one thing I'm very, very good at. And I may not be I may not be a, a Middle Eastern sco uh, a scholar of Middle Eastern re uh, rhetoric and literature. I might not even be a, 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 a have a PhD in uh, in ancient archaeology. But the one thing I'm really good at when it comes down to it, which I think he has a, that Richard Carrier has a very big problem with, is I'm able to actually analyze the archives. I'm able, I'm good at looking things up. And the one thing he has yet to do is cite properly the people that, that, that he is not a part of. He's not a part of the consensus. The consensus is very, very strong. And the reason being, the reason why the consensus is very, very strong is due to the fact that you cannot hold a double standard in in this field and look credible. For example, a Tiberius was the contemporary of Jesus. He was contemporaneous to Jesus, and he was the, he was the emperor of Rome, Tiberius Caesar. And uh, Tiberius Caesar himself um, only has about ten sources, maybe let's say ten to fifteen sources. With a, within 150 years of his lifetime, uh, testifying about him. But when it comes to Jesus, within 150 years of his lifetime, we have over 40 sources. Uh, and that's much more. That's four times the amount of source material to work with. Um, if, you look at, if you look at Tacitus' uh, uh, as testimony, for example, in uh, in Annals uh, chapter uh, fifteen, uh, section forty four, he talks about the the crucifixion of Jesus. He oh, also talks about oh, oh, the Christ mythers will scream at you that's an interruption. I don't care. I don't. I don't care. I don't care. care. Yeah. I, don't care. I that sorry. I I'm sorry, but I'm gonna say this right now. I'm gonna say this right now that that is actually not an interpolation. The interpolation actually comes from, uh, the actual interpolation was uh, from Josephus. It's actually in, a, it's in the Greek manuscripts of Josephus. But when we actually go into, uh, when we actually take, when we go into uh, the Arabic uh, copies of Josephus, we don't find that interpolation there. Josephus still admits that Jesus existed. And we, he still admits in the Arabic copies that Jesus was crucified. So when all is said and done, the misrepresentation of the evidence is very, very, it's very glaring. And so uh, when it comes down to it, um, the burden, when, it, when they, using the, 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 the concept of burden of proof that the atheists actually hold to, uh, R Richard Carrier better come up with some pretty good damn evidence of why I should believe him uh, that 
uh, the historical Jesus didn't exist. If you yep. can't, so say la vie, I'm using your, I'm going to use your standard against you because you have the burden of, because by the same standard, you have the burden of proof, Richard Carrier, since you have no evidence to the contrary and that there are no, there are no authors denying his existence at all in Roman times. And many, and guess what? When it comes to Tacitus, he was not very nice about it. When it came to, when it came to other authors, they were not very nice about it. Uh, including Lucian of Samosata, as strong or weak or whatever, I don't care. They were very, they were very, very vulgar against Jesus himself and the Christians. And I love that because that's called enemy attestation. And the enemy attestation shows that it most likely occurred. The probability is too high to not take seriously. Yeah, so I this is, I'll end this one at this. Until until Richard Carrier can give me good reason why I should take him serious, I'm not. The only reason I'm taking his uh, issues serious at this time is because he's lying to people that can't think for themselves, which means actually go to the sources and look at them. Oh, I'm but done. he used, he okay. used Bayesian, theory, Bayesian theorem to come to his conclusion. Didn't you know that? I do need to be wrapping. We do need to be wrapping. We've hit our hour and we're probably going to go a little over. We try not to go over an hour usually here, but um, it's an important topic. And I just had a little bit of a spiritual experience. I really did. Um, and and uh, I'm tend, I'm tend to not to ignore these little things. Um, uh, so I will just say I don't take back any of the things I said about how Carrier made my life worse and made life worse for a whole lot of people with his work because truly he did. As a Christian father, I can't tell you what it means to me that I now, this was inconceivable 20 years ago, but I now have to fear for my own son's physical safety because of people like Dr. Carrier, and I mean it, and I will not accept any angry fulminating from him that he's not responsible for what these other people do. Yes, he is. Um, or he has no response. He has some responsibility. He has quite a bit, um, especially because that 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 little social justice leftist progressive pseudo Marxist hate cult that was new atheism demonstrably made things worse in my life. It made worse. Th it's made it made me afraid for my children's future. Um, it is it is not made for people being more enlightened. It is not made for people being better. Just look at what all your ideological confrères have done in the last few years, Richard. You recognize the names I just gave and some of the people you just heard me criticize. Um, and I could go on and on and on and add pe people from your community who just turned into really horrible human beings. And that was nobody's fault but yours because the Christians were always nice to you. Although I suspect what you're going to find soon is that a lot of Christians aren't going to be nice to you. Nevertheless, when I hear about this man having lost everything and being completely broke and uh, uh, destitute, um, you know, I could say he deserves it. But I, I was in that condition once. I was just chatting in the chat room. I haven't called out the people in the chat, but someone had asked, uh, you know, uh, about God and where you'd find him. Is he an, an anthropomorphic, magical, immortal? Uh, and, you know, I answered and I said uh, that, you know, as, as we've always understood it, as intelligent people have always understood it, God is the, the mind that operates the universe, okay, like we're in a video game. God is pure thought. Um, God has no physical form, just like your thoughts have no physical form. The Christian message is that God chose to take human form once, Christians believe. As it happens in other religions, they believe it may have happened more than once. Christians don't, like the ancient... Uh, the ancient Stoic theists uh, believe that Zeus was the unmoved mover, the uncreated creator, the mind that was ultimately uh, operating all of time and space, but that he would occasionally take human form, which is what a lot of the myths of him taking form were about, and some of the other gods in the pantheon. I mean, the Greeks were not that primitive um, when you really study what they were about. But anyway, I said what Christians believe is that God chose to take human form once. And then Matt, who is, I think, is an atheist. I'm not sure, but I think he is. He, I, I've seen him before, and he's kind of a snotty one, but not a bad one. Actually, he's not that bad at all. 
Um, but he said, I suspect the homeless men in my area are all God. I have weird thoughts. And I immediately thought, <clears throat> yep, Jesus said we ignored guys like, Jesus said every time you ignore somebody like that, you're ignoring him. So Richard, if you need someone to talk to, uh, I don't care. I don't care if people have this number. It's not hard to find. 248-242-0303. I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with you anytime and uh, take the gloves off because uh, it looks to me like you've received punishment <laughs> in this life already for your misdeeds. And having been an atheist and also a terrible fuck up who doesn't get a lot of things he regrets, I at least know what that's like. So um, uh, if he really is in that kind of in that low of spirits and really is that devastated financially and otherwise, uh, well, uh, there is a God, Richard, and um, that, there's all there is to that. Call me anytime if you really need help and, and, and somebody's really lying about you and that you can prove to me that somebody's really lying about you. I know how these polyamorous relationships work. I even know how people in them will be w cool with it one day and then accusing you of something nasty the next day because they didn't want to be that poly after all. I know all this. I know all the jerk, man. So you just got an offer. Um, uh, I'm probably the only man on the Internet who would have that conversation with you. But I would. And I wouldn't be mean to you at all. All right, everybody. So there it is. I don't know if anything's going to come of that because that was the spirit moving me. Um, and that shit happens, uh, believe it or don't. Um, I hope people in his circle found this entertaining uh, or found this enlightening. And if you didn't like the mean tone, I've just got to tell you, my tone was no nastier than Dr. Carrier himself often uses and no nastier than people like, uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens. So get used to it and get used to the fact, by the way, that actually while Christians have been trying to be nice to atheists for a long time, we're not obligated to be. We're really, really not. And we know how to get mad and we know how to fight. We're awfully good at it. All right, everybody, like I said, give us a like, give us a subscribe. Tomorrow we will be uh, going after the odious uh, Aaron Ra, and uh, we got more besides. We're here every night. So, uh, and we are also looking, just in case we get censored, into moving to another platform. So, God bless everybody. Thank you, everybody who came for this. Thank you. It would have been so much effort to try and get that out, but we got our, our, our science experts. We got our our math experts, oh, we, we got we got classical theists, please go subscribe to his channel. We got Mathoma, please go subscribe to his channel. We got White Engine, please go subscribe to his channel. Uh, and Ave Maria.